Willkommen to episode 8 of, okay, so this one time, okay, Storytelling Monday. This time, I'm trying something different. I've been trying a lot of something's difference is. I started going through my scrapbooks. I have a ton of scrapbooks. My closet is full of scrapbooks. Probably eight different ones that are just the Michael Jackson era alone. So, of course, when I pull out photos, it brings back memories that are so cool, and I can go down this rabbit hole and tell you all about it. So I have a little bit of that, and then I totally spaced. I forgot that in the DVD that goes with my CD entitled What Error, I did a whole thing on the behind the scenes of the Flight of the Bumblebee shoot where I covered myself with 150,000 live honeybees. Why on earth would anyone do that to try to sell records and for the adventure of it? And because, you know, you only live once. And so I'm including that footage that was in the DVD because there's there's some really cool stories that the bee wrangler Norm Gary tells. And there's some different footage that you haven't seen before. So I'm putting that in. And also musicians, a lot of musicians will know who Nicholas Slonimsky is. He's a musicologist. I met him when he was 97 years old, and he was such a hoot. We started hanging out. In fact, I had a slumber party. I brought some girlfriends over. We spent the night. We brought our jammies and cocoa and teddy bears and just sat around listening to him tell us stories of the Russian Revolution and all kinds of wacky stuff. He's known in the kind of jazz music circles in Berkeley and Musicians Institute and around the world for a book he wrote called The Thesaurus of Scales and Melodic Patterns. That's a mouthful. And it had a big influence on John Coltrane and Eddie Harris and uh, Joe DiOrio. So you get those stories too. They call it Story Monday. This is a picture of me sitting on the front of the stage waiting for sound check to happen on the Bad Tour somewhere on the planet. And I love it because you really get a feel for the enormity of the size of the stage. I was smaller than just one of his loafers. Here's a picture of a bunch of us hanging out in the hallway after we've got our makeup done and before we put on our stage clothes. The dancer in the foreground is Lavelle Smith, a wonderful choreographer that's worked with Michael quite a bit. On the Bad Tour, everything was so new and exciting. The day after shows, I would go out to the newsstands and collect anything that was about the tour. And after a while, I thought... This is ridiculous. I just cannot keep all of this crap. I mean, stacks of magazines and newspapers. It was absurd. So I pared it down to just a few after a while. This is a review of our show in Nice, France. One day, the makeup artist Karen Faye decided to have some fun with me. So she put a bullet hole in my head. And I went walking around backstage just talking to people in the crew. Nobody noticed. It's amazing how many people actually don't even look you in the eye because they're not expecting a bullet hole in your head. So uh, this was the last thing I did before she took it off and put on my proper makeup for the show. This is an ad outside of Osaka Stadium in Japan, and you can see the sponsors. Pepsi was a huge sponsor. There were a couple of reps that used to go to the show very early to make sure the giant 9,000-foot bottles of Pepsi were blown up and placed properly. And the other sponsor was the Japanese company, Nippon Telegraph and Telephone. This is me hanging out with some of the local Japanese crew that were always working so hard. I thought they looked so cute, so I wanted to take a photo with them. This is outside another venue in France. There aren't too many people where you would see their silhouette and know exactly who it is. There's no mistaking that that would be Michael Jackson. I love this picture of Michael, and I had a really great one from a poster I think I picked up when I was in Japan and kept it rolled up and put it in my guitar case so it wouldn't get creased while we were touring. And I put it in a frame, and it stayed on the wall in my studio until the earthquake in the early 90s, and it came crashing down with about 2,000 cassette tapes. My studio was an absolute disaster. So that was the end of the poster. And I also had a Michael Jackson fedora that got destroyed at the same time. But 
I got pictures and memories. Here's a picture of me in the big ass hair hanging out with Rob Lowe. A couple years before I got the Jackson gig, I was hired to go teach him for a movie that he was working on where he would play guitar and he was going to portray Eddie Cochran. I don't think the movie ever happened, but it was kind of cool to give him a couple lessons. And here's a picture of me with my tech, Damon Kelleher, uh, watching as I hang upside down from the scaffolding for the stage. Not long after that, the tour manager came along and thought that was a little too dangerous, so I totally got in trouble. And here we have the two guitar techs, Jage Jackson and Damon, changing my strings. I was so spoiled, neither John Clark nor I had to change our own strings for a year and a half. Boy, I tell you, you get used to that. The first time I saw Norm Gary was when he was playing jazz clarinet covered in bees on the Johnny Carson show. I knew my record company wanted to shoot a video for Flight of the Bumblebee for my first record, and I also knew right then and there that I had to track Norm down. I called him up and told him I wanted to get covered in bees for a video, and he laughed. And then he discussed all the things I hadn't thought about, like having a nurse on site with adrenaline in case anyone was stung and allergic to the venom, and of course there were insurance issues. It was an amazing experience to be a part of and to watch the process of how he got the bees ready and would smoke them to calm them down. He knows all the tricks of the trade to get bees to perform. Here he's putting some insect repellent on my face so the bees at least stay off my face and hair for the most part. And this is synthetic pheromone odor drops so the bees think I'm the queen bee. And the queen bee is removed from the hive so the bees don't feel defensive. He spent 32 years working as a research scientist and professor at UC Davis, and he also became the number one call in Hollywood whenever bees were needed. He arranged the bee scenes in a lot of movies like My Girl and Fried Green Tomatoes, television shows and commercials, and he also got in the Guinness Book of World Records twice for bee stunts that he did. At the time of this video shoot, he estimated he had been stung 50 to 60,000 times. The bees here were on racks of screens, and he had a big scoop. He would scoop them off and put them on me. It was a pretty cold day, and bees create a lot of energy, and I felt like I had a nice warm jacket on. Originally, I thought I'd be playing guitar for this shoot, but then I realized that when you move your arms, for instance, you bring your arm up and then you put it back, bees can get trapped, and that's how stings happen. So knowing that, I was perfectly content to just sit there still. It was The whole thing was probably about an hour, from when he first started putting bees on me to when he started removing them. I think here I'm looking to the heavens, the little baby Jesus, to save me from what I have gotten myself into. I did have some visions the day before the shoot of possibly ending up in the hospital full of welts and trying to explain to my parents that it was all my idea. I decided to take advantage of the situation and be filmed and photographed holding honey and honeycomb Cheerios and Pepsi to see if the companies might be interested in making use of such an outrageous visual. I was very paranoid about getting stung at that point because my arms were moving. And then after we shot a few products, then Norm came up to me and said, okay, now's the hard part, getting the bees off. <laughs> and I remember I was a little shocked with that statement because I hadn't anticipated that to be a problem. So he started smoking them again, and then he had a, a vacuum or a fan to get them off my neck area. And then he slowly moved me away from the site and got the bees to swarm and go back in their happy homes. I managed to go through the whole shoot without getting stung once. And then I was about three feet from my car when the whole thing was over and I got nailed on the leg. Here I had to get his autograph on a great photo that's in a book called A Day in the Life of California. It's got him covered with bees and playing clarinet. He's a great player. This is one of those once in a lifetime experiences that you realize once is enough. <laughs> All the bees on his back. <laughs> you get the impression he goes to bed like that. Yeah. <laughs> the night that I did the uh, Johnny Carson show last summer, I had a previous show at one o'clock in the afternoon of the Orange County Fair. And I have a, a high pressure air jet to blow the bees off me after the cluster. So I was blowing away, in a big rush to get away for the Carson taping. I was blowing away and blowing away, and I forgot that right by my mouth with this oh. high pressure. Ah. I blew my mouth open like an envelope, you know, and at the same, <laughs> at the same instant, a bee went flying by there, boom! Oh! It was like a bullet, and I got stung on, in the mouth. Oh, holy shit! And that was just before the Carson show. Then I got on the Carson show, and I was playing my clarinet. I was having a hell of a good time with a good band back up, and, and I got down to the last three or four notes, and I went, and oh there was my a God. bee inside, and I went, oh. finished the music, and that was it. Did he sing it? No. She. Wow. She. <laughs> Yeah. 
I met Nicholas Lenimsky when he was 97 years old. I found him to be such a colorful character and a great wit that I kept coming back to visit him. For his 98th birthday, I threw him his first ever slumber party, which made all of his friends very jealous. I had half a dozen friends come over to his house with sleeping bags and jammies, and we sat around listening to these rich, rich stories of his last century on Earth while consuming cocoa and cookies and petting his cat named Grody to the max. And you know what happened to him? <laughs> I first became aware of Nicholas from my mentor jazz guitarist Joe DiOrio. Joe turned me on to one of the many, many books that Nicholas wrote, which was a very advanced revolutionary concept for music, the thesaurus of scales and melodic patterns. It was embraced in the jazz community by people like John Coltrane and Eddie Harris. And his Lexicon of Musical Invective book is a book every musician should own. He compiled hilariously bad reviews of all the major classical composers. It's a fantastic insight, because anytime you get a bad review, just know that Rimsky Korsakov got nailed too. I asked him to conduct me in the Flight of the Bumblebee video, and we got him all dolled up in a tux and looking sharp. And we also made him a conducting baton that was wrapped in yellow and black stripes for the bee theme. I think we all had a really fun day that day. Do you still have your baton? Uh, what happened to my baton? I gave it to, to the Library of Congress. Really? Wow. First song is Flight of the Bumblebee. <gasps> Or believe it or not, but I had a dream about having to conduct uh, uh, the the bumblebee. Really? In in my dream, and I said, well, "How do I conduct it?" So I used to conduct it uh, 60 years ago. And it <laughs> oh, look at this! I mean, she's covered with bees. Nicholas had a very high IQ and spoke five or six different languages. He started teaching his daughter Latin until she came home from kindergarten and said, Daddy, none of the other kids speak Latin at home. As a conductor, he was way ahead of his time and brought modern classical music to the Hollywood Bowl way before they were ready for it. It's not every day you can hang out with a man who lived through the Russian Revolution. I feel really blessed to have known him the few short years that I did. Here, Nicholas was just cracking us up, playing and singing the silliest songs that he wrote for products like Pepsodent and Castoria, which is a laxative for children. Amongst the great volume of work he did over 101 years, he did an orchestral piece called My Toy Balloon. It's a set of variations on a Brazilian song which calls for an explosion of 100 colored balloons at the climax. An idea that was as colorful as he was. Now I... I read a review and it just says that I'm a genius, almost what my mother told me uh, 80 years ago. So I said, why do you have to wait 80 years to tell me that I'm a genius when my mother told me that 80 years ago? <laughs> tell me something, I don't tell know. Me something. <laughs>